Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight. I am Dr. Lauren Zarda, and I have the honor and the privilege of being the 18th president of Greensboro College in our 185th year. Uh, I welcome you here tonight to the Hannah Brown Pinch uh, Memorial Chapel on the grounds of Greensboro College for the 15th annual Karl Schloenitz Lecture on the Holocaust and Genocide Studies. It is events such as this that we acknowledge the contribution of noted scholars who help us gain a better understanding of our human condition. To more fully consider the events, trends, developments, and realities that shape our knowledge of global culture and reinforces our need to always be seeking, researching, and considering our past and how we have been able to inform who we are and what we shall become as students, as scholars, teachers, researchers, and global citizens. Tonight is such an occasion as the research and analysis of our speaker follows in the footsteps of such distinguished thinkers as Hannah Arendt, Victor Frankel, Stanley Milgram, Stephen Katz, Philip Zimbardo, Richard Brightman, Susanna Heschel, Rich Crane, and many more, 15 years. All in their own way, adding to our understanding of how seemingly ordinary events in an established culture can lead to organizations and people committing unspeakably heinous acts, war crimes, crimes against God and man. As important aspect of our intellectual heritage at Greensboro College in our 185th year, and indeed the liberal arts traditionally, it's the willingness to tackle difficult subjects and ponder deep questions of who we are how we interact, and how we deal with a constantly challenging and changing world around us. Greensboro College remains committed to its relationship with scholarly studies of the Holocaust and genocide, and is honored to have named this lecture series after noted historian teacher, the late Carl Schleunis. Dr. Schleunis, a longtime distinguished faculty member at the University of Nurse Canada Greensboro, has written many seminal, seminal works on the Holocaust perhaps notably legislating the Holocaust and the twisted road to Auschwitz, Nazi policy, policy towards German Jews, 1933 to 1939. While Carl is no longer with us, his widow Brenda is with us tonight. Brenda, would you please stand so we can acknowledge your extraordinary contribution. It is also my privilege to honor and recognize Mrs. Jane Lowenstein Levy and a former member of the Board of Trustees of the college, Dr. Richard Levy. The Levy's have been the primary supporters of this lecture series and have also established here in the James Addison Jones Library at the college right across the green, the Levy Lowenstein Holocaust Collection, a collection of manuscripts and monographs and scholarly materials and artifacts that greatly enhances and enrich Shoah studies here at Greensboro College and across the region. Our interlibrary loan documents show that it is being used by students and faculty throughout the triad. Dr. and Mrs. Levy, please stand to be recognized and thank you for your steadfast support of these inspective aspects of life at Greensboro College. Two logistical items. <clears throat> First, please silence your cell phones and anything else that might make noise while we're in the lecture. And secondly, while it's highly unlikely, you will see three exits if we should have to do so at the back on the two sides. I now will introduce our faculty member who will introduce the speaker. Dr. Jason Stroud serves as visiting assistant professor, excuse me, not visiting, you are now official, I'm sorry, this is an old, as assistant professor of history and social sciences and education. He received his bachelor's in history from the Citadel, his master's in history from NC State, and his PhD in American history uh, from UNC Greensboro. His specialty is the American South and specifically revolutionary area North, Car North Carolina history. He has a long career in public schools, including four years as supervisor of social studies, <coughs> curriculum and instruction for the Guilford County Schools, and has taught courses in American and European history at UNC Greensboro and Greensboro College before joining the faculty as a full-time member of the faculty in August of 2021. Dr. Stroud, if you would introduce our speaker.
Thank you, Dr. Zarda, and uh, welcome to everyone in the chapel and uh, to those who are live streaming this uh, lecture on the Campus Religious Life channel on YouTube. Uh, we're very fortunate tonight to, to welcome Professor Doris Bergen. Um, were I to do justice to your achievements and your career and your publications, I'd, I'd be eating into your lecture time, which I, I, I don't want to do, but here it is in, in short. Uh, Professor Bergen is currently the 2023-24 uh, J.B. and Morris C. Shapiro Senior Scholar in Residence at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and she appears uh, here tonight courtesy of that institution. Uh, she is the uh, Chancellor Rose and Ray Wolf Professor of Holocaust Studies at the University of Toronto. Uh, her research focuses on issues of religion, gender, and ethnicity in the Holocaust and World War II, and comparatively in other cases of extreme violence. Uh, she's written or edited many books, including Twisted Cross, the German Christian Movement and the Third Reich, uh, War and Genocide, A Concise History of the Holocaust, The Sword of the Lord, Military Chaplains from the First to the 21st Centuries, and Lessons and Legacies. Many, perhaps all of these books, as by way of a plug, are uh, available in the collection, in the, uh, the Levy Lowenstein Collection in the library. Uh, Professor Bergen has received many distinguished grants and fellowships, and before teaching at the University of Toronto, she taught at the Universities of Warsaw, Pristina, Tusla, Notre Dame, and Vermont. Her current projects include a book on German military chaplains in the Nazi era and a study of definitions of Germanness as revealed in the Volksdeutschen uh, Germans of, of uh, Eastern Europe during World War II. Uh, it should be clear from uh, what I've just read that uh, Professor Bergen's uh, talk tonight, entitled Were the Nazis Christians, uh, draws on these themes. So please welcome me in, uh, tonight in welcoming this year's Schwannis Lecture, uh, Professor Doris Bergen. Thank you very much, Professor Stroud, for the warm introduction. I also want to thank Richard and Jane Levy for their support of this lecture series, and a special thanks to Brenda Schloinis for being here. It's a real privilege for me to give this lecture named for Carl Schloinis, a leader in the field of Holocaust studies, whom I met as a graduate student at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and I read his work at that time but who I had the pleasure of getting to know personally, particularly in the day that we spent together with you, Brenda, and Carl, your daughter, and your grandson in Cape Town about a decade ago. It's an honor for me to be here at this difficult and polarizing time in our world and in the field of Holocaust studies. And I wanna say at the outset that I'm trying with this talk and with all the work that I'm doing in this field to hold open an understanding of the study and the commemoration of the Holocaust that hears the cries of people everywhere who are suffering, that hears the cries of the victims of the Hamas attacks of October 7th, that hears the cries of children and their families in Gaza, that hears the cries of people in our own communities who are suffering. I'm grateful to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for the year I'm spending there and for sponsoring my visit here. And I want to say at the outset that the views in this talk and the interpretations are my own and don't represent the museum. Finally, one last word of thanks to the readers, you'll hear from them, who generously have agreed to be part of my lecture today. Now, I first gave a version of this talk where the Nazis Christians at the Holocaust Museum in October to the group of Holocaust survivors who volunteer as docents at the museum. Amazingly, there are 30 Holocaust survivors who work actively at the museum, volunteering, meeting students, speaking to the public, and answering questions. After the Hamas attacks on October 7th, that group of survivor docents issued a statement that I found quite helpful and encouraging, and I wanna just quote a part of it to you. They said, quote, we are Holocaust survivors who volunteer at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum 
sharing our experiences with the public. We're always grateful to see how much interest there is from young people from every part of the world. To hear their comments and questions gives us hope for the future. And that's the spirit I want to give this talk in as well. Now, the topic, were the Nazis Christians, I think is important in a number of ways, both particular and universal. What I mean is this topic is important for understanding what was distinctive about the Nazi assault on Jews, but it's also important in understanding how extreme violence is woven into the fabric of societies. It's not something that's out there on another planet. It's part of societies that are quite familiar, maybe similar to our own. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions, I think, around the topic of the Nazis' Christianity, and there's also a lot at stake. So I want to start by telling one anecdote that maybe illustrates some of the misconceptions. As you heard from Professor Stroud, I used to teach at the University of Notre Dame. The very first class I taught on the Holocaust, I had some time, you know, left over, so I asked students, does anyone have any questions that they've always wondered about? Immediately, a student shot up their hand and said, what religion was Hitler? I said, well, that's an interesting question. Does someone want to venture an answer? Quickly, another hand went up and a student called out, Jewish. I said, no, Hitler was not Jewish. Although that rumor has circulated for many years and I explained to them why we know as historians that this is not indeed true. So I said, maybe someone wants to venture another guess. There was a longer pause and a hand went up hopefully and said, Protestant? I'm like, no, no, Hitler was not a Protestant. Well, then the class was silent. Nobody was willing to put up their hand and say, Hitler was a Roman Catholic, born and died a Catholic, he was never excommunicated, nor did he renounce um, his you know, religion into which he was baptized. So perhaps you could already tell from that anecdote that the answer to the question of my title is going to be, yes, the Nazis were Christians. But that answer can also be perhaps modified with the words, well, it depends. It depends what you mean by Nazis, it depends what you mean by Christians. But I don't want to go too far with the it depends theme because it depends quickly devolves into what I call aspirational definitions. Aspirational definitions are definitions of a group, how they maybe want to see themselves, like real Christians don't kill people, or I'm a Canadian, real Canadians aren't racist. Aspirational definitions are important for members of a group, right? They challenge you to be the best version of yourself, but they're not helpful for analyzing a group. You can't just define out of membership the people who you don't agree with or don't admire. There's another problem too, which is that aspirational definitions can serve to cover up the harm done. So to give again the example Canadians aren't racist, this kind of a claim makes it very difficult to actually combat the racism that does exist. So we're going to save it depends a little bit and mostly for the rest of the talk, wait I got to make sure I can advance my, I already forgot, oh how to do it, exactly. Um, building on the answer yes, the Nazis were Christians, we're going to discuss the ramifications of what does that yes mean when you look at different aspects of the Holocaust. The perpetrators, what I call the witnesses, collaborators, rescuers, victims, and the legacies. So let's start with the perpetrators. Were Nazi perpetrators Christian? Well, the easiest way to answer that question is by looking at statistics. This pie chart shows you the religious membership of Germans in 1933. You can see there almost two thirds of the population was Protestant, 
about one third Catholic, a very small percentage, people are often surprised to hear that, less than 1% of the population was Jewish. The percentage of Canadians who were Jewish in 1933 was actually higher than Germans. This is not widely known. Uh, compared to many other parts of Europe, Germans, uh, Germany's Jewish population was small. And then you could see about 4.5% other. Many of those people were also Christian, member of smaller Christian groups, Mennonites, Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others, and smaller numbers of non-Christian religious uh, people, Hindus and Muslims, and small numbers, and also very small numbers, atheists, people who had renounced all religion. By the end of World War II, after 12 years of Nazi rule, that chart had changed very little. Sadly, the most significant change was the small number of Jews dwindled to a much, much smaller percentage that would not even show up on that chart. Now, statistically, the Nazis were Christians because Germans were Christians. And we can track this easily because the Catholic and Protestant churches, members of those churches paid church taxes that were collected for them by the state. And this arrangement continued throughout the Nazi period. Now, the Nazis were also Christians culturally. Christianity shaped German society, the holidays, the rituals of daily life, the names, the kind of rhythms of birth, marriage, burial, and so on. And Hitler himself often performed his piety in public with you know, important occasions held in front of churches, even on occasion inside churches. And the reason that he performed his piety publicly is because it added to his legitimacy to do so. And it added to his legitimacy because members of the German public considered Christianity important. Nazism, of course, also had some ideological links to Christianity. Nazism was not itself another form of Christianity, but Nazi ideology used Christian imagery including and especially anti-Jewish imagery, and adapted it for its own purposes. Those two illustrations both come from a very famous Nazi children's book, The Poison Mushroom. And you can see in the one image with the mother and the children, the use of the old lie that Jews killed Jesus, here being repurposed as an anti-Semitic slogan of Jews as the enemies of the German people. The other image showing the man and the woman coming out of church with, this, with the you know, caption, baptism didn't make them into non-Jews, of course, takes the Nazi notion that Judaism was in the blood, ineradicable, and turns it into a sexual threat, right? You can see the way the male character is cast, lecherously looking at the two women and the woman character also interestingly cast looking lecherously at the priest, the Catholic priest, again using the notion of the church and somehow the idea of Jews infiltrating, bringing that Christian scene um, into Nazi purposes. There were also institutional links between Nazism and Christianity again, maybe not so widely known, is that Christian religion was taught in all schools in Germany throughout the Nazi era by Christian clergy, priests and pastors. And also the German military, the Wehrmacht, had Christian chaplains, Protestant and Catholic, who accompanied the Nazi military wherever they went, including in all the areas of mass slaughters of Jews, Soviet prisoners of war, civilians of all kinds. This image that I'm showing you here is from Tomir, a city in uh, that time German occupied Ukraine, where in the summer of 1941, the military chaplain, a Protestant here, presided over a huge Christian service in a re-consecrated church, a church that had been closed under Stalin. You know, the communists closed a lot of churches. Um, 
And when the Germans marched in, they reopened some of those um, for religious purposes. At the exact same time and place in Jatomir, August 1941, in fact, on the same square as that cathedral was located, there was a major execution, public execution of two Jewish men, which 400 Jewish men from the region were rounded up and forced to watch, all of them taken and shot outside the city. So the reopening of the church and the massacre of Jews, these were part of the same procedure of the Germans claiming that territory. Now the chaplain in the case of this um, particular church service preached the familiar gospel story of Jesus cleaning the church, chasing out the money lenders from the church, did not have to change the words at all for it to be used to describe the supposed cleansing of the Judeo-Bolsheviks from the church and from the region. Chaplains did not preach a kind of Nazified gospel, but familiar gospel stories. And in fact, in my research, I found some sermons by military chaplains, including a Protestant chaplain, uh, Pastor Muller, Eberhard Muller, who served in the occupied Soviet territory also in 1941-42 during mass murders of Jews. And to read an excerpt from this sermon, we're going to hear from Professor Straub. very much. So Christian chaplains provided the sacraments, they gave mass to German soldiers, they also, I learned from my research, offered general absolution, Protestants and Catholics, to soldiers before combat. And as you can see from this quote from another Catholic chaplain in this case, promise that the gates of heaven would be opened to soldiers who died in combat. Now it's quite important to emphasize that the role of Christianity was an active one, not simply silence or doing nothing, as is often said. I'm talking about a very active role. Now I don't mean that the churches launched officially a crusade or that you had like, you know, pastors actively killing Jews or Soviets. The churches as institutions didn't physically fight Jews but individual Christians, including people who were very active in their faith, did serve as hands-on killers. I listed a few high-profile examples there. Um, one Protestant theologian who was the head of an Einsatz group, a mobile killing squad, killing hundreds of thousands of Jews by shooting in the summer and fall of 1941, or the SS men at Westerbork in occupied Netherlands who celebrated Christmas while literally organizing the transport of Jews from the Netherlands to Auschwitz and Sobibor to be killed. And I mentioned there also research that came up just a few years ago about a Mennonite from southern Ukraine who was the leader of a killing squad as well. And there's other examples too. These individuals are rarely addressed and almost invisible in many of the German sources. You have to look from outside to see this particular role of Christians as killers. And here Jewish sources are often more helpful. One source that I found um, very helpful is an interview with this woman, a Hungarian Jewish survivor, Agnes Mandel Adachi, who in 1944, she had been baptized Protestant during the war Maybe for that reason, in the summer of 1944, she was moving around the city of Budapest, working for Raoul Wallenberg, 
the Swedish diplomat who tried to spare Jews from the transports to Auschwitz. In that terrible summer, Agnes Adachi witnessed an incident that she described in her interview, and Jane Levy will read it for us. Thank you for reading that passage. For Agnes Adachi, this scene encapsulated the Holocaust. A Christian clergyman killing a Jewish child in front of a church. So let's go to part two, the witnesses. Now I use this label because I didn't want to emphasize passivity like the term bystanders, but rather talking about the group of people, not direct perpetrators necessarily, or victims, but witnesses, rescuers, people involved in different ways. Did the fact that Nazis were Christians have an impact on them? The answer, yes, huge. Now, as probably you all know, Europe was at the time, like Germany, overwhelmingly Christian. So Christianity provided a bond for other societies other countries to Germany. That bond, in turn, created opportunities for others to assert their own interests. Let me give you a few examples. Consider the country of Slovakia. Slovakia became an independent state because of German support. It was a German client state uh, during this period, a very Catholic society. And in fact, the head of the state was a Catholic priest, Josef Tiesel. Slovakia, bounded to Germany, was the first country to hand over its Jewish population to be sent to Auschwitz to be killed in 1942. And in fact, initially, the Slovak authorities actually paid the Germans per person to take the Jews away. And they paid extra so that the children would be taken as well because they didn't want the potential disruption of having those children um, without their parents. Another example comes from Croatia, also a client state. The independent state of Croatia was formed with German support under the leadership of the fascist Ustasha. The Ustasha participated willingly in killing Jews, but they also had their own priorities, which were not identical. They were interested, often in many cases, more interested in killing Roma and especially Serbs, many of whom were expelled, killed, and forcibly converted. Whoops, did I? Oops, no, I went too fast. Wait, sorry. Expelled, killed, and forcibly converted from Orthodox Christianity to Roman Catholicism. Uh, the scholar Daniel Matijevich refers to this as a double conversion, both religious and ethnic. The third example I wanted to mention here is Ukrainians who hoped that the Germans would give them also an independent state. Didn't work out that way. Um, Ukrainians were recruited into the Waffen SS. Unlike the other SS units, they had their own Christian chaplains, Ukrainian Catholics who served them um, in the field. That shared bond of Christianity also opened other kinds of opportunities um, for Christians all over Europe. One of those opportunities was proselytizing. We have cases of Christian missionaries trying to convert Jews in the most desperate circumstances, including in ghettos in Hungary. To read an account describing this from someone who experienced it firsthand, we have Robert Brewer, and thank you.
thank you very much. Sometimes the shared bond of Christianity provided opportunities to help Jews. A very interesting example of this comes from a survivor, Sofia Zabramnaya, who survived the war in the occupied Soviet territory. She and her grandmother, Russian Jews who were passing as Christians, were stopped by a German. And to hear the story of what happened to them, we're going to have John Cox. Thank you. So Christianity, the possibilities of conversion, real or feigned, and the pressures that came with it also created many opportunities for Christians all over German occupied and partner states of Europe to rob and betray Jews. A very, I think, vivid illustration of this kind of betrayal comes from this interview with Edith Sommerfeld, a Jewish survivor from Romania, interviewed in Toronto in the 1990s, and it's going to be read for us by Anne Hurd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nonetheless, in the years and decades after the war, the designation of righteous among the nations, recognizing non-Jews who helped Jews, has become deeply sought after, not as a personal honor, but as a national honor. We know, for example, that the Dutch government promoted many of the cases that went forward for recognition as righteous. The same has been done and continues to be done by the Polish government. And now we see authorities of Turkey, Albania, Italy, Morocco, and many other places eager to see people from their nations recognized as righteous. It's perhaps worth noting that individual Christian killers are always dismissed as bad apples, but individual rescuers are seen as somehow typical of the society as a whole. So let's turn to the category of victims. Was it significant for victims that Nazis were Christians? The answer absolutely in so many ways, and I'll try to just touch on a few. One thing I notice in my research is that Jews were able to see continuities to the Christian past, to the history of Christian teaching of contempt for Jews, of Christian pogroms, in ways that Christians themselves often couldn't see, right? When you're in the middle of something, you don't recognize it as easily. This woman here, Nama Bakshi, is a Jewish woman from Crimea, um, actually a member of the Krimchuk, a group of Jews in that region. And she was interviewed in Russian. One of my research assistants uh, translated that for me. And Bakshi's interview tells many interesting things about having German officers billeted in their home. They didn't recognize them as Jewish because their 
form of Judaism was not something the Germans knew anything about. But what caught my eye in this passage was the last part of it where Bakshi talks about how when the Germans, what does she call them? I can barely see it from here. SS Gestapo death squad soldiers moved in and claimed buildings and houses. They marked those buildings with a cross. They drew a cross on it. Stop and think about that. Why are Nazis drawing a cross? Couldn't they draw a swastika or SS Bolks or you know the letter D for Deutsch or something like that? By drawing a cross, they situated themselves in the long tradition from Constantine to the Crusades to the plague and the pogroms where the cross symbolized power, protection, salvation, and blessing for Christians. But for Jews, the cross symbolized an accusation of deicide, was a weapon against Jews. Now, Christianity was ubiquitous across Europe, so it meant that Jews who were passing as Poles or Hungarians or French or Dutch people, in fact, always had to have a religious component. Even in the Soviet Union, as we saw from the quote that Professor Cox read, to pass as Russian, the grandmother and her grandchild had to prove that they somehow were Christian. This meant, for instance, that Polish Jews had to pass as Roman Catholics as well as ethnic Poles. And again, to give you a sense of what that might have looked and felt like, I'm gonna have a quotation from the memoir by Renia Kukielka, a Polish Jewish survivor, read by Professor Strout. Thank you very much. Now, as you can see there, the cross offered, in a sense, protection, but also erasure, right? Erasure for Renya Kukielka of the Jewish identity, even as that provided a protective layer of a Christian identity. And this combination of protection and erasure, for me, was really illustrated vividly by the photograph you see here of Paulette Feiler, you can see from the caption, the picture was taken in 1943 in France on the occasion of her first communion. Now, Paulette Feiler was the daughter of a Russian Jewish man, Byro Feiler, who was shot as a hostage in France in 1942. And her mother, a Lithuanian Jewish woman, Raha Lea Feiler, was arrested by French police, sent to Majdanek camp, and murdered there. Somehow the mother, before she was arrested, managed to get her two daughters, Paulette and her sister, into a convent for safety. When word came that the girl's mother was dead, the priest in charge of the convent called the two girls into his office and said, now you are alone. The time has come for you to be baptized. The kind of bitter feeling that accounts like this can leave you with 
can easily lead us to forget that it didn't have to be that way. There were options for coexistence between Jews and Christians in the pre-war period that now in hindsight seem impossible, obscured by the violence of the Holocaust. One important example comes from this Yiddish autobiography written by a Polish Jewish teenager before the war using the pen name Jeanette, she heard that name in a movie, um, where she describes the push and pull of relations between the Jews and Christians in her high school classroom. And to read it for us, we won't make her read it in Yiddish, but in English, we have Julie Schatz. Thank you. Thanks for that reading. So now we're at the last section, legacies. What difference does it make for what came after the war that the Nazis were Christians? Here too, there are so many strands we could follow, we can only take up a few of them. One of those sort of post-war ramifications was I think a strong sense among many Jews that now the barrier between Judaism and Christianity was insurmountable, and perhaps it always had been. This sense of that insurmountable barrier is articulated, I think, especially kind of vividly by Mordecai Singer, uh, born to a Hasidic Jewish family in Vienna. He survived the war through the kinder transport in England, and after the war, he attended university studies in England, and he provided this recollection that's going to be read for us by Brenda Schleunis. Thank you, thank you for that, thank you for that reading. Another post-war repercussion, again, maybe easily forgotten, is that for Germans, Christianity provided a bridge to the allied victors, particularly to the Americans, the British, and the French. And often in the allied zones of, Western allied zones of occupation, it was the churches and religious activities that were the first to be allowed to restart after the war was over. However, it's good to remember that not everyone was convinced of the sincerity maybe of the Germans. And here we have a very interesting anecdote from Billy Wilder. Maybe many of you are familiar with the well-known Hollywood filmmaker who was born to a Jewish family in the Habsburg Empire and who served in the US Army of Occupation in Bavaria immediately after the war in the region around Oberammergau, you know, where there's a famous passion play reenacting the Easter service um, that happens every few years. So Professor Stroud is gonna read this one for us as well.
I gotta admit, I was so proud of myself when I found that. It's like, I never saw anybody, anyway, um, yeah. Wait, now I lost, I lost my track there. Um, so the role of the church is the presence of Christianity in so many central ways throughout Nazism in the Holocaust is something that I think both in scholarly discourse and even more in popular discourse is repeatedly forgotten and has to be rediscovered. And this really struck me lately where many of you I'm sure saw the headlines about the opening of the archives in the Vatican and the shocking headlines, the Pope knew about the Holocaust. That same headline, you could read it in the 1940s. You can read it in the 1960s when the book by Rolf Hokum, the play, the deputy came out. You can read it in the 1990s, but it's like every 20 years, you know, we gotta have the same shock again. Um, many statements and apologies, especially since the 90s, have been issued from the churches, but always, it seems to me, they're, pref they're prefaced, prefaced on the idea that Christianity is something separate, right? That the biggest crime of Christianity was its silence, rather than acknowledging that Christians and Nazis, they were intertangled. This is probably one of the most well-known apologies or statements that came from the Vatican in 1998. We remember the Shoah issued by Pope John Paul II. It's quite a moving statement in many ways, but if you look at it closely, I'm not gonna have someone read it, I'll just draw your attention. You can see the many ways that the statement distances Christianity from Nazism. It emphasizes that Nazism was a neo-pagan regime, that anti-Semitism had its roots outside of Christianity, that the church too was persecuted, um, and that um, only concession it makes formed like a rhetorical question is that perhaps, perhaps, I gotta look here if I can see it, did anti-Jewish sentiment among Christians make them less sensitive or even indifferent to the persecutions launched against the Jews? The fact that the persecutions were launched by Christians, that the national socialists in power were Christians, this is the entanglement that I think such statements stop far short um, of recognizing. So yes, the Nazis were Christians, what do we do with that knowledge? Maybe this is the time to return to the it depends, not as an excuse, but rather as a reminder to listen for the multiple possibilities and even the exceptions in the historical past. I think about the famous line you know, from Elie Wiesel who said, not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. Maybe we can paraphrase that and say, yes, the Nazis were Christians, but not all Christians were Nazis. Another way to be attentive to that variation is to consider the many different ways that Jewish survivors and victims talk about their own relationships to Christianity in the past and present. And just to give you a little glimpse, I wanna close with three different quotations, all from Jewish women who survived the Holocaust as girls, passing or baptized as Christians, and how they talk about that baptism. So the first one, whoops, I gotta go back. The first one interviewed in Toronto, um, Anita Eckstein will be read by Lolly White. Thank you. A contrasting view comes from Rosa Silverschmidt, a survivor from Germany via the Netherlands, who said simply about baptism, quote, well, I didn't like it very much, but it saved my life. And the third one, a very interesting case, comes from a German Jewish woman, Karin Bosgang, who actually survived the war here in the US 
taken in by a Baptist family. And she describes her experience in terms you'll hear from Jane Levy. Thank you. I want to give the last word to someone who didn't survive. And that's Eddie Hillisom, a Dutch Jewish woman who kept extensive diaries, both in the transit camp of Westerbork and before that, uh, working for the Jewish Council in Amsterdam. Eddie Hillisom herself was uh, killed at, at Auschwitz, but she wrote these words in her diary that I want to use as a conclusion, and I guess I'll read them myself, that quote, that is all we can manage these days, and also all that really matters, that we safeguard that little piece of you, God, in ourselves, and perhaps in others as well. Alas, there doesn't seem to be much you yourself can do about our circumstances, about our lives. Neither do I hold you responsible. You cannot help us, but we must help you and defend your dwelling place inside us to the last. And the end of the quote and the end of the talk, and I thank you for your attention. The thing I want to say is I have a hearing disability and I'm probably going to struggle to hear those questions so I've asked Professor Stroud to repeat the questions so just be patient if I don't get it the first time or if I answer something you didn't ask. Professor Bergen, thank you for your hard work and your historical analyses. I'm struggling with the idea that Christianity wasn't simply associated in relationship with Jews in Nazi Germany, but that Christianity actually propelled the final solution, if not a great deal of the atrocities. And I was wondering if you're willing in your analyses to go that far. Just sum up, I think I got it, but let me hear the summary. Uh, he's talking about a question in his mind, maybe uh, that you could clarify, or if you're willing to go so far as to say that Christianity propelled the final solution rather than perhaps being associated with it. Propelled, I think, is too strong of a word. I think it's enabled is the correct word. That's what I would say. So it's not that... Christianity caused Nazism, but it's also not that Christianity simply stood by. Like this is the way it's usually understood, right? Is that the fault of the churches is that they were silent. And people love to quote that, by the way, it's made up, that quote, you know, all it takes for evil to triumph is good people to do nothing. I find that a really inadequate interpretation of the Holocaust and genocide. What it takes for evil to triumph is a lot of people doing things, you know? And so Christianity didn't cause the Holocaust, but it was, what do we say, not a, yeah, it was one of the, you could say a necessary, but not a sufficient condition, you know? So it helped prepare the ground. So you could say Christian teachings of contempt for Jews and so on, they made Jews a recognizable target. You know, that's thing one. And then there's also practical ways, I didn't even mention it, but you ever think about under the Nuremberg laws, how did the Nazis decide who counted as Jewish or not? Turns out it was pretty unclear. They couldn't just look at your name or your face or whatever, even though they said all that stuff. They also couldn't check your blood. There was nothing you know, to show Judaism. 
What counted under law was the religion of your grandparents. That's how the Nuremberg Laws determined who counted as a Jew. If you had baptismal certificates for three or four grandparents, you counted as Aryan. If you only had two, then you were a so-called Mischling. They didn't know what to do quite. Those people buried. If you had one or none, then you count under the law as Jewish. Now you think about that definition. It was said to be racial based on blood, but it was actually based on religion, right? They just pushed it back a couple generations. Well, how did people prove that their relatives were Christian? They had to go to the church and get the baptismal certificates. There was no computer registry. There's no other way to do that. People had to write to the church and get those certificates. The church has had to hire extra staff members, copying out of those giant old tomes, right? And for certain kind of jobs, like to be in the SS or to be a university professor, you had to go back multiple generations. So even at the very practical terms, the official churches, they had to participate in producing those certificates. In some occupied territories, we have cases, many cases, of pastors and priests who either falsified baptismal certificates, sometimes for money, sometimes they baptized people by the hundreds because maybe they thought, you know, that's bringing more Christians. Inside Germany, I've not seen any cases of that. Like the church authorities, they hired people and they filled out that paperwork. So that's just one really practical way. But I think, yeah, propelled is too strong. There's Christianity, and there was sadly Christian anti-Judaism in many places, but it didn't produce genocide, you know? So you need some other factors that come in there. The political leadership that mobilizes the society behind that, you know, effort. The war, you know, there weren't six million Jews in Germany. The Germans had to conquer Poland, Soviet Union territories. That's where there were much larger Jewish populations. So Christianity is not the main cause or the only cause, but it's one of the participating factors. That's how I would describe it, like an enabler or a partner rather than propelling. I just wanted to say that I have in my hands an unpublished manuscript. And there, it's a look at up to 1939, but the first three or four chapters are about all of the contortions that the Nazis went through to try to define a Jew. And they went from completely insane suggestions like employing people to go through every baptismal registry of every church, but then they figured it would take about 30 years uh, to, I don't, I don't know, there were just so many, many things. and I. I started looking at this and it took like four or five years before they came up with something even they could accept. I mean, this I could hear. Thank you so much for that clear use of the mic. Did you want to ask more? No. Yeah. I want to comment on that I because- I want to ask. I just wanted to yeah. throw that in. Yeah. But I do want to respond to that because the point you raise is so important. I mean, yeah, Carl's book is called The Twisted Road to Auschwitz. And that idea of the Nazi leadership not following a straight path, but following these contortions, it's so important, not because they were hesitating. They had their eyes on the goal of, they didn't know quite what it would look like, but the future would be without Jews. Like, that goal was there. But how they would get there, and what amount of terrain that would cover, what that would look like, you know, expulsion, killing, all these different things. And so, this idea of the definition, it's not that they were hesitating because they were trying to find something logical or whatever, they were worried about public opinion. So you always think, you know, dictators, they don't care about public opinion, not true. Dictators care a lot about public opinion because without the public, what are they, right? They need that. And from the point of view of Nazi, not only the leadership, they believed Germany had lost World War I because they were stabbed in the back by the home front. So they're like, what do we gotta do to win a war? We gotta keep the people at home happy. How do you keep them happy? Well, you don't ask them to sacrifice. You make sure you got a lot of plunder, keep them rich. 
bring in those forced laborers, steal whatever you could steal from every place you conquer, that's how you keep the home front happy. You're not gonna ask too many questions. Now, the thing is with defining Jews, the difficulty was the number of Jews was pretty small, but they were pretty integrated into society. There was quite a high degree of intermarriage. So if you have a Jewish partner and a Christian partner, that means there's a whole side of the family tree that from the point of view of the Nazi leadership, they don't want to lose the potential support of all those people. So yeah, the definition had a big public support issue. It also had huge practical repercussions. So again, in hindsight, people talk about, oh, you know, they boycotted Jewish businesses. People picture like a store, like a mom and pop store, you know, run by Jews where they put a sign on there. Well, that's all well and good, but this was a large modern economy. A lot of businesses had thousands of employees. They had shareholders. They had, so who's gonna be hurt if you have a business like that and you boycott it? Is it gonna be one Jewish owner? Is it gonna be like, so this thing, like sorting out the definition had to allow what some people have referred to as the social death of Jews. That term comes from Orlando Patterson, sociologist who studied enslaved people. And social death, that's like when people exist, they're living, they're moving around, but they have, the rest of society feels like they owe them nothing because they have no past, they're cut off from their past, and they have no future, right? So if you see someone and you know, they're not, they're, they got no power, they're not gonna be around here, you could do anything to them. And so this idea of the definition, it had to be about allowing breaking up ties. They didn't want to break up marriages because that could get people upset, right? So instead you put social pressure on people. You know, you can't join the party if you don't divorce that Jewish wife. You can't get an officer's commission if you don't cut your ties with those Jewish relatives. So they bring on these informal pressures and push apart family members, romantic partners, friendships, business relations, it took some years, right? That's why the kind of things that were possible by 1938 with the Kristallnacht pogrom, and then by 1941, when almost all the Jews are kicked out of Germany, they wouldn't have been possible in 1933. They gotta do it step by step. So that twisted road, that contortion, again, it's not about not knowing where they're going, but it's more like, figuring out what does that even mean exactly, you know? And it's almost like, sorry, I gotta answer too long, but the more like the Germans gained power with expansion, with military expansion, the more that sort of vague idea of future without Jews became a reality. It's like, we can kill all the Jews in Poland and they're doing it and they're getting away with it. And now there's Hungary and we're going there and we're gonna do that too. And so it's like the goal became sharper as the possibilities increased and as their power grew. So that's why that, that twisted road concept, it was a really important articulation. First of all, thank you for coming. I hope you can hear me. Good. Um, and thank you for mentioning which I think was a very important book. But I wanna go back to the Nuremberg Laws, okay? So the clarification, Nuremberg Laws were September 15, 1935, and the clarification defining Michelin first degree or mixed first degree or mixed second degree came only two months later in November. Now, the clarification was very important if I, had two grandparents who were Jewish and two who were Christian, but I attended church. Or one grandparent who was Jewish and three Christian grandparents, but I attended church. So there are scholars, as you well know, that believe that between September, the Nuremberg Laws, and November, the clarification with the Michelins, that intensive pressure was brought by the Catholic and Lutheran churches to get that clarification so that they could claim or so that they could protect churchgoers who had 
Jewish blood. Now, if that's true, and I see you rolling your eyes at it, but you could see all the way from there. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and it's open. Got to work on my It's open face. to debate, but you realize that if it's true, it says that at least in 1935, the Catholic and the Lutheran churches had still had a considerable amount of power to make a difference. I did hear that question. I think I can answer. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm allergic to tree pollen. So yeah, what can I say? It's so beautiful around here, but yeah. This is a really, really interesting question and certain things, you know, this is exactly what I work on, right? The churches and Nazi Germany, certain parts of what you said, 100% I agree. Other parts I wanna sort of change a little bit or maybe challenge a little bit or add something to. So you're absolutely right, you know, there's clarifications. Other clarifications are added on later too, like the measures are adapted to black Germans the same idea that they can't march behind the flag, that they can't marry the Aryans and all that, it's also added to Sinti and Roma afterwards. So there's a number of other measures that come on afterwards. The thing about, you know, clarifying those privileged positions, sadly, it's a beautiful story that the pressure came from the church. I just have not seen any evidence of that. And seriously, I've been working on the churches in Nazi Germany since 1990. Like, I just don't see it coming from the church at all. What happens instead from the churches is that there's a debate about what to do with clergy, the Protestant church, who are themselves have some Jewish ancestry. So it starts already in 33, and I'm sure you know about it, but I'll explain it for them. So there's a debate in 1933 that some elements within the Protestant church, they're like, we want to basically jump ahead so 1933, the Nazis came to power, they put in this civil service law, and they said Jews can't be civil servants. But they didn't have a very clear definition of Jews at that point. Jews can't be civil servants. So it led to a lot of, you could say, denunciation. Some, people, some cases were obvious. Other cases, people wrote in and they tried to get rid of their own coworkers or bosses they didn't like. They're like, yeah, the law says you know, he's not Jewish, but his wife is Jewish. I think he should be kicked out. Or So there's a lot of jockeying around that with the civil service law. But what people learned was basically you could not err if you interpreted it in the most ungenerous way possible. You know what I mean? And with the civil service law, there's no protest from the churches. The protests that come, there's tons of petitions. And Thomas Pegolo Kaplan has worked on that. People flood the authorities with petitions. Some of them come from people themselves saying, I was a veteran of the war. I fought for this country. And you're going to deny me my job? You know, other petitions came from coworkers where people were like, yeah, we agree that in general Jews should be out, but this coworker is a really valuable employee and we think there should be an exception. And so, and there were also people who made other kind of racial claims. They're like, my mom told me that my dad is not my biological dad, the Jewish father, and my mom had an affair with like, you know, the mailman, and I therefore should not count as a Jew. And I'm like, people made these claims and they went through the courts and through the cases. So there's tons of those things. They do not come from, sadly, they don't come from religious organizations, the opposite. A group of Protestants say, we want to jump ahead of the law and get rid of all Protestant pastors who have any Jewish ancestry. We want to impose that Aryan paragraph of the church. And first of all, there weren't very many people who fit that description. Probably you could maybe say 20, 30 people. Um, and the Nazi authorities did not support that initiative. And again, not because they thought, you know, people with Jewish ancestry should be allowed to be pastors, but because they knew the Protestant church, Lutheran churches, they had a lot of international ties. And at that point, 1933, you didn't want to alienate the international. So in that sense, the idea of international Lutherans played a role, but the mitigating factor from inside, if anything, elements within the church were willing to jump ahead. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that's, so that's why I think, like, the, the distinctions you are so right to point to, 
I think they come from these petitions, the pressures that come from, like we do not want to be flooded with all those petitions, so let's make some distinctions about the privileged and non-privileged. But even though if those, if you look at those subcategories, they're so interesting because they're never simply about race or blood. It's like, okay, if you have, you know, one Jewish parent and one non-Jewish parent, so-called Mischling, you know, then it would come down to things like, well, you know, do you, are you a member of a Jewish congregation? Then suddenly you're not privileged. Or if there's a marriage, are there children? If they're children, you know, it might be a privileged marriage. If it's not like, so it's much more about who is gonna attract attention, who is gonna complain, you know, then I'll just add one more thing. In Slovakia, there the Catholic Church pressure not to break up existing marriages did have an effect on the passage of the law. So you do see it in some places, but I don't see it in Germany. Okay, I think we're gonna have to have one last question. Oh, sorry, my answers are too long. Oh, but the questions more. are interesting. Two more. Thank you. Um, so during your talk, you speak of two different sorts of Christian participation in the final solution, as I see it. In one case, there is, you describe the Christian association with Nazi, Nazism as pragmatic in nature. The, they used institutions of the church to characterize who was Jewish and who was not but this was because of its usefulness. Um, on the other hand, there seems to be a sort of zealous movement that is happening at the same time um, where some are excused from the horrors that happened by virtue of converting to Christianity. And apparently this was enough to satiate some people involved in, um, during, involved in the Holocaust. So I'm wondering if you'd like to comment on which you would consider to be the more, well, it's hard to characterize a populist movement, but do you, um, which do you think characterized better the, um, Christian involvement in the Holocaust, the zealots <laughs> or the <laughs> pragmatists? Thank you. I think I understood right, and you're saying like, which is more characteristic, the sort of almost parasitic use of Nazism of Christianity or Christianity maintaining some like small sphere to be able to help in some cases through conversion. I guess what I'm really trying to show is that they're part of the same fabric. Like this is what I said at the beginning about like, genocide being woven into the fabric of society. Like these things are inseparable, you know what I mean? And one of the reasons that conversion, which by the way, officially under Nazi law, conversion did not help, right? Like if those kids were caught or like the you know, woman and her grandma, the, that Russian priest could have just said, whatever, they're Jews, they would be killed. So officially the conversion didn't help. What you see is in some practical cases, the reason conversion made a difference was because some other Christians recognized it. You know what I mean? So, but that's because Christianity was an important part of society. So that's why the Nazis used those institutions because they were important and they were valuable. Like I say, Hitler, I don't know about his own religiosity. People can talk about that up one and down the other, but he understood it was valuable for him to present himself as a pious person but I think it's not like, do I think Christians were more yeah, complicit or more heroic? They're all part of the same story. That's what I would say. So those heroic exceptions are often inseparable from the complicity. You know what I mean? So you have cases, it's like the convent that sheltered those two girls, Paulette Filer and her sister Denise. 
Are those righteous rescuers? Well, they saved those girls. Their mother was murdered and their father was murdered and the girls survived. At the same time, what did they say to them? Now you're alone, you're going to be baptized. So they saved them, but they also like, you're going to be raised as Jews. So does that make them evil or does that make them good? Well, those terms are not the terms that, as a historian, are sort of helpful for analyzing, right? So I think your question to me is interesting precisely because it shows it's really, it's interwoven and it's part of the story of Christianity being just like woven in at every level. Um, um, I, I found your, your talk really uh, very interesting, so thank you so much. Um, um, I, uh, I was interested in the subject, um, I, but just to mention, um, my, my father fought in the um, U.S. military, and um, his unit wound up in Dachau, which is not a, a concentration camp, but um, has It was a, a concentration camp, not oh, a killing sorry. center. It wasn't a killing, uh, killing facility. Um, my uh, uncle uh, Ernst was a German Jew who escaped and later on fought in the British Navy. And then you, you mentioned uh, over uh, Rammergau, and I realized that uh, my mother was uh, a civilian in the U.S. Um, Army after the, after the war, and she actually attended, I think it was in 1947, the, the, the performance. Uh, that was the, fel the, the, the best spiel or something like that, right? But anyway, but my, 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 I'll try to make my question um, clear because you brought up so many interesting things. You mentioned things about social death. Uh, I guess that's a gradual process of, of dehumanizing. Um, it, doesn't, that, doesn't that lead to a eventual stateless condition of many people who wound up being killed, uh, Jews and others? Um, the very fact that they are rendered stateless um, and I just, I just want to try to put uh, the Jewish Holocaust experience within the larger um, mass killings that went on, in, in especially in Eastern Europe. Um, can you help me with that? Yeah, I think I, I think I heard the question. A lot of interesting things to say. First, amazing about your mother being at the Oberalbergau performance. It's like, whoa. Um, I'm just going to take up the last part of your question because the time is short. So. I strongly think it's crucial to situate the mass murder of Jews in the context of the war and in the context of the multiple programs of mass killing. And that for me has been central to my approach to the Holocaust always. So, you know, if you look at mass killing in Nazi Germany, the first victims were people considered disabled. The murder of disabled children begins in 1939 even before the invasion of Poland. Um, and you think, well, you know, if you look at the Nazi kind of rhetoric, the whole notion of, you know, Jews as the arch enemies and the conspirators, why did they start killing people with disabilities first? Why didn't they start with Jews? Well, the answer is really obvious and it goes back to that twisted road, I think. You know, who's an easier target? Kids, many of them already institutionalized, separated from their family, a whole rhetoric about like useless eaters and burdens on society. That wasn't unique to Germany either, right? Like this way of talking, that eugenics way of thinking was widespread. And so you might say, well, how's that connected? Well, the people who started the program first killing children considered disabled, and then they quickly expanded within a few months to killing adults as well. You know, already by the time the first ghettos for Jews are established in occupied Poland in 1939, tens of thousands of Germans with disabilities had already been murdered. Well, first of all, it's contagious. Once the Germans got into Poland, if they needed buildings to set up their headquarters, they took like hospitals and mental hospitals, they just killed all the people in there and took over the building. Because like, why shouldn't they? They knew they're already doing it at home. Then. When you get in 1941, the creation of massive killing centers for killing Jews in Poland and occupied Soviet territory, Treblinka, Sobibor, Auschwitz, Belchex, Chelmno, the commandants, the leading staff of all those killing centers were trained in the murder program for killing people with disabilities. 
that's where they, why? Because they had the expertise. They knew how to kill people in mass numbers, how to dispose of their bodies, whatever. Like that, you look at those commandants, Rudolf Huss, Franz Stangl, commandant of Treblinka, Sobibor, all of them. Um, they got their career started in that program. So you can't separate this stuff out. It's linked. And you mentioned the civilian populations or Soviet POWs. Also, by the way, these categories overlap. Germans killed three and a third million Soviet POWs. You don't think that many of them were also Jewish? Like, you know, these categories, they're not separate categories. Same with people with disabilities, you know? Um, but the killing programs, they also facilitated other killing programs. So Auschwitz, you know, when the Germans started testing Cyclone B, right, that poison gas that was used to murder so many Jews at Auschwitz, the first experiments, they tested it on Soviet prisoners of war. That's who they killed first with that Cyclone B. So these things are also connected together. They're part of um, a big story. It has its distinctiveness. That's why I said at the beginning, the relationship of Christianity to Judaism, that is what I think makes the Nazi treatment of Jews distinctive, but it's also embedded in other ways with other programs of killing. On that note, I want to I think I speak for everybody. This was uh, a fantastic, a fascinating talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks to the readers also.